I'd like now to introduce our program participants who will examine and expand upon tonight's program title, Creativity, Culture, and Community, The Legacy of Jonas Salk. This conversation will include Dr. Peter Salk, second from the right, Peter is the president of the Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation in La Jolla and collaborated with his father at the Salk Institute on AIDS research and other projects. He currently resides in La Jolla where he continues to be involved in research. To his right, his brother, Dr. Jonathan Salk. Jonathan is a psychiatrist practicing in Los Angeles where he specializes in family and child psychiatry. Jonathan and Peter both have commented that the greatest gift their father passed on to them was an understanding that medical research should make a difference and that it should positively impact public health and social justice. Their brother Daryl is also a doctor involved in biotechnology research in Seattle and the fact that all three are physicians and that all of them were imbued with this awareness and commitment speaks volumes about the kind of man Jonas Salk was. Our third discussant this evening is Mary Walshock. Mary, who is a faculty member <laughs> in our Department of Sociology, also serves as the campus's Associate Vice Chancellor for Public Programs and the Dean of Extension. She is the author of numerous books, including most recently, Invention and Reinvention, The Evolution of San Diego's Entrepreneurial Economy. Mary has been extremely instrumental in shaping tonight's program, and it is yet another example of the wonderful collaborations that Mary and I have enjoyed in the 15 years that I've been here. So thank you, Mary, for that. And then finally, our moderator tonight is Gary Robbins. Gary is the science editor <laughs> for the San Diego Union Tribune and a regular on the Mesa. Over the years, he has written many stories about scientific research and the local biotech community in San Diego. He is an astute observer of the past and the present comings and goings on the Mesa. Um, I hope that you will enjoy the program, and I'm happy now to turn things over to Gary and our colleagues. Thank you. Before we go on, uh, I want to give a little background. I want you to picture something in your mind. Imagine standing at a train stop. Maybe you're in Solana Beach, maybe you're in downtown San Diego, and you're waiting for the train. Time to go home. You hear the train off in the distance, and then it gets closer, and you can see the train. And it gets closer to the station, and maybe it has a certain schedule top. You're ready. You're going to take your bags and get on the train. But the train doesn't stop. It keeps going. It whooshes through. Sounds like an insane thing, but there was a time in the early 20th century where that happened a lot in this country. You just needed to merely mention the word polio. If there had been an outbreak of polio in some communities, trains would actually not stop in those towns. People were so afraid of being infected. There was a great fear in part because people didn't really know a great deal about how polio spread. You know, um, Jonathan and um, Peter have both told me about that. It was a situation where it was so bad that some people stopped hugging, some people stopped shaking hands. They were just in fear it permeated American culture and did so for a long, long time. This whole thing didn't break until the 1950s when Jonas Salk developed the first effective vaccine against polio. It was an extraordinary thing. It is considered one of the great medical accomplishments of the 20th century. But that wasn't the end of things for Jonas Salk. That really was kind of the beginning of things. He went on to have a second act and his life was really quite extraordinary. He went on, under a lot of odds, to found the Salk Institute for Biological Studies here in La Jolla. In fact, when they started construction, they didn't have all the money they needed to even finish it. He was a, a person of belief that they would raise the money uh, at a very hard time to do that. And he went on and created the Institute. His idea for the Institute would have, was that it would be a place of biology and the humanities 
because Jonas Salt was a humanist. He wasn't just a scientist and a biologist, he was a humanist. He believed in a lot of different questions. He wrote books in addition to doing his research. His books took up, took up some very, very deep subjects and they can tell you because they were involved in the organization and the writing and the clarification of all of those books. Jonas Salk asked questions like, what is man's relationship to man? What is the biological potential of man? What are our values? Are we being good ancestors? Uh, what was the impact of science on society, which is a question that particularly resonates today in a place like this? And how do we confront the horrors of advanced um, science? You know, we could build nuclear weapons, and what did that mean? What was the impact? We're seeing that this afternoon with tensions between the United States and China. So Jonas Salk was a scientist and a biologist, but he was a humanist as much as anything, and he wanted the Salk Institute to be just that. Um, it became part of that for a while, but it primarily has emerged as one of the major biomedical research institutes we have. But we're going to talk about creativity this evening and culture and community, and I want to start right there. Last year when we were, um, uh, when we were doing interviews for a story that we did on Jonas Salk's 100th birth, um, I talked to both of you, and one of you mentioned to me that your father was a biophilosopher. I had never heard the, uh, the word before. I could break it in half and kind of get what it meant, but tell me and tell them what that meant. What, your father defined himself such. Yeah, I think the important thing to know about my father is that he wasn't just a scientist in the sense of doing experiments and um, having things happen in the laboratory. He was always thinking and he was thinking about the deep meanings of life, of existence, and of the interactions between people. He informed his thinking by what he referred to as the scriptures of nature. He would look to nature to give the indications and the clues as to how things function, how the world works. So he developed his own way of thinking about nature and about the forces that move us. Since it was, a, it was a philosophical point of view, but based on biology, based on life, based on observations, this is why he tended to refer to himself in his later life as a biophilosopher. He didn't keep it to himself, uh, did he, Jonathan? He talked to his kids about it. Oh, <laughs> he, he talked a great deal about it. He talked to most anyone that he met about it. <laughs> um, and and from, from an early age, I can remember being part of or long discussions or, or, or long discourses on his part as he sorted out his ideas, as he talked about nature, as he talked about life in, in essence. And um, very much left us with a, with a sense of that for ourselves. But in looking back over his life, it's just a remarkable the degree to which he was governed by those principles, that he touched on the basic principles of life, the basic principles of the cosmos. Those were the kinds of things that, that he talked about. It almost sounded funny at times or uncomfortable at times, but as I've gotten older and looked back, I've realized how much wisdom w was in, involved in that and, and how much creativity was in what he thought and went through. It almost must have been odd in a little way because I sat in your kitchen and listened to you talk about it and you talked about going on family vacations at a lake. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember where it was. But you were telling me that your father would sit down and he would go into these deep conversations and he would engage you in these serious conversations at the time. And what you wanted to do was play. <laughs> you were a kid. You were a kid. How did you react to that? Some of them were really boring. <laughs> But as Jonathan said, something rubbed off. Mm -hmm. His way of thinking, even though there wasn't so much in the way of uh, playing catch or throwing balls around, um, there was something about his honesty, his depth of caring about people that just, it just rubbed off on you and, and you, be, you couldn't help but being shaped internally by the sort of the ethos, it's just the, the way he thought and the way he moved around in the world. He didn't have an off switch, did he? No. <laughs> I mean, um, you um, allowed me to drop by the family compound over on Sumner Canyon, and um, this was a place where Jonathan, excuse me, where 
Jonas Salk wrote his night notes. I don't know if many of you know about this, but he would wake up several times at night uh, and write on a legal pad uh, his thoughts. And two, three, four o'clock, I mean, it wasn't once or twice. He woke up through the night, he, you know, whenever he had a thought, he had to get it down on paper. And people later uh, could, um, uh, could uh, transcribe it. And later, actually, some of it became the basis of books. But his mind was never off. No, his, his work was his play. He, he reveled in, in the process of thinking, in the process of writing, when he was active in research, in the process of research. He also it extended it a great deal because he was very skilled at dealing with people and getting things done in the real world so that he had a way of making connections with people and moving things forward. And that made him able to do great things like to build the Salk Institute or to build the vaccine. But he never stopped it. I was talking to, was it Barbara that I was talking to earlier uh, this evening? He would dictate his notes into a tape recorder while walking on the beach. So when other people had to transcribe it, what they heard was him and kashoosh, kashoosh, the waves, <laughs> the waves breaking in the background. I even read stories that he would record it while he was driving. Now, we're going back in time now. <laughs> Didn't you have some experience with um, that? I, I didn't have a personal experience with it, but, but he did have a little skidding accident one time in, in the rain. <laughs> a little skidding accident? <laughs> yes. Well, he was very careful. He said he didn't lose control of the car. It just hopped a little bit. <laughs> OK. Is that the person you knew? Because you knew Jonas Salk. Did you see a mind that was always on fire? Absolutely and someone who everybody wanted to be around. He was like a, a, a light that energized everyone. And, uh, and across, you talked about his interdisciplinary and his interest in the humanities and the sciences, and we wrote a little bit about it in our book. He, uh, he was able to energize and bring people together. I mean, the mayor of San Diego, right? He goes down there with Louis Kahn, and Charles Dial, right? He'd had polio. Mm. And they made a connection. And the mayor became Jonas's advocate. And I think he had that quality of making connections with people from all walks of life. And it's interesting getting to know his sons, right. as I have in the last couple of years, the extent to which his humanity, not just his humanism, but his humanity was at the core of his work as a scientist. And it really translated into a lot of the success that he was able to have here a perfect stranger. I mean, a, a superstar, rock star, scientist, but uh, influencing a rather conservative military-based town. Well, let's add a little context to that. You mentioned the mayor. The mayor had had polio, the mayor of, um, of San Diego. This is what year that they begin to get together and decide like whether 58, that... Like 58, 59, yeah. 60. Right, right yeah. in there. Right okay. in there, yeah. So they're having these talks, and there's this incredibly beautiful spit of land right there along the bluffs, and all the discussions were going on. And another really prominent person was in play, Roger Revell. People here will know that name, yeah. Roger Revell. So how did he interact with Roger Revell, and how did it lead to them actually de dedicating a piece of land that would become what the Salk is today? Well, the land that Jonas wanted had already been designated for UC San Diego. Mm. And Ravel, I think, understood what it would mean uh, for Jonas to come here, mm -hmm. just as he understood when he brought the mayors here and he brought Jim Arnold and all of these extraordinary people that came in the early 1960s. And he basically agreed that the city should give the Salk Institute the 27 acres that he had hoped right. UC San Diego would have. And there are just dozens of stories like that mm -hmm. from the 1960s. And, and it wasn't that they were making deals. It was that they were constantly working back and forth with one another, trying to build something that was very new and very different. And it meant they had to help one another. Is it true that your dad was mesmerized by that particular piece of land, by the view there? Yeah, yeah he was. Go, please. <laughs> you're, you're he right. wanted it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My UCSD colleagues will know that. It's, it's it, um, a story that he often told is that he literally, he was planning to move to Stanford. Right, <clears throat> right. And 
somebody mentioned something about La Jolla, and he just came, he came here to say no. He came here to just rule it out. And literally, when he walked out on the spot on, on the bluffs there, he thought, this is the place. And things proceeded from there. Wow. Mary, what if he had come back down here and said no? How would that would have affected the evolution of what the Tory Pines Mesa is today? Well, I think it, it could have had uh, very negative effects because it was the simultaneity of a half a dozen people like him deciding to take a chance on this barren mesa. I mean, when I was a girl, you know, we rode horses and hiked, and I think there was even a Boy Scout camp. I never went to it, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted. Um, but the whole mesa, you know, that we see today just didn't exist. Even when I first came to UCSD, it was virtually undeveloped. And I think the fact that uh, uh, Ravel understood that you probably couldn't get 100 people to say yes. But if you got nine or 10 of the right people to say yes, they would each get nine or 10 of the right people to say yes. And look what we have. Look at TSRI. Look at Salk. Look at UCSD. So there is, I mean, I think those guys were pretty prescient. It all seems so much fun and beautiful today, but this was actually a very difficult time. I mean, your father had been extraordinarily successful. He was an icon, but the money from the March of Dimes was beginning to decline. Um, he wanted to create an institute, but where would the money come from? Where would the site come from? How would you pay for it all? Isn't it true that he had a lot of agony about where to put it and how to fund it? It was not his strength to be raising money, and he was very fortunate in having such a good relationship with Basil O'Connor, right. who was the president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which is now known as the March of Dimes. And the closeness of that relationship facilitated all of this happening, so the uh, National Foundation made commitments to the Institute to provide the funding that was needed. And it's been a long struggle for the Institute over all of these years to maintain the suffi sufficient funding with funding from NIH, from private foundations, and even more important nowadays is becoming the individual contributions as government um, inputs are, are declining. So from the very beginning, this was, a, this was an uphill, um, uphill battle. Was he a risk taker? Because when they started that, they really didn't have most of the money. They started and like, it'll come. And I think they even stalled con construction a time or two. It took time. Um, was that his personality? Well, <clears throat> I was actually just about to say, Gary, that, that there are two aspects to his personality that I think truly were his genius and his greatness. And he did wonderful work with the vaccine. But what he excelled at was the ability to have a, an idea, a vision, and then figure out the ways and work through all the details to get it to happen in reality whatever it took and whatever it needed to, to do that. So that, that sense of that ability to get things done in the real world with real people, as Mary was describing, I think that was truly an aspect of his genius. And right alongside of that was his courage. It is just astounding to me now as an adult to realize the, the two major projects that he took on. One was that polio vaccine at the age of 36, 37, 38, 39. Um, and to, to put forward a, a vaccine in a trial that he was confident in, but, but he was really at the center of the storm. With the Institute, absolutely remarkable. They broke ground, they didn't have money. He had faith that there would be a way to do it, and he went ahead and, do it, and, he went ahead and did it. That level of risk taking, that level of courage, and the level of success that came out of it was really remarkable. Yeah, one of his uh, phrases was pulling a rabbit out of a hat without a hat. <laughs> But, but I think it's important that he also got people to take those risks with him. Exactly, exactly. Right? I mean, Louis Kahn and all the people who were supporting him. The people of San were, Diego. Yeah, and the people of San Diego. Two thirds of the citizens voted, I think it was in 59, right. to give the 27 acres that UCSD had hoped to have <laughs> in its campus uh, to the Salk Institute. I mean, that's amazing. Well, he also had to sell people on the idea of what he wanted to do at the Institute. Peter, what is it that he wanted to do? It wasn't just a biological institute. 
He had something else in mind. Now it was interesting because the polio vaccine uh, field trial results were announced in 1955, the vaccine was introduced. Within two years of that, he was already planning a new kind of an institute, which he thought would be at the University of Pittsburgh where the polio vaccine work had taken place. And in a very interesting document that was written, handwritten in um, May of uh, 1957, so just two years later, he was talking about putting together an institute for experimental medicine, which would involve all of the traditional or the important traditional areas of work having to do with infectious disease, diabetes metabolism, vaccines, cancer, etc. But you've already used a, a phrase which was man's relationship to man. In that document already, what he was talking about is gathering a group of people who would be highly skilled at science, but who would be broad people. And what he said was that his anticipation was that as time went on, the Institute would also be dealing with the problems that arise from man's relationship to man. So from the very start, this was something that, he that was very important to him. And those problems or challenges did come. I was thinking of something from just earlier this year. The Salk announced it had made an advance in trying to grow human cells in pigs. The ultimate idea is regenerative medicine. Can you grow human organs in pigs and then transplant them into humans because there's a shortage of human organs? Well, if you just pause for a minute and think about that, well, it's extraordinary science, and there's a need for the organs, but is that what we want to do to animals? I'm not giving an opinion on it, but I'm just saying it raises these really profound and difficult questions, and it isn't the only area of science where we deal with this. Yeah. No, we have to be very grateful for the contribution of animals to the work that's been done in, so, in many different areas. There would not be a polio vaccine if it hadn't been for the work that was done in animals. And people are rightly concerned about um, having effects on animals that, they're not, uh, that aren't desirable from the animal's point of view. We can be really grateful for the contributions that they have made to not only human health, but also the health of other animals. But early on, he brought Jacob Bernowski yes. to the Institute. And Bruno had that deeply interdisciplinary and humanistic uh, set of values and did that incredible series, The Ascent of Man, which is still watched on television. And the book that Little Brown published is still read. And he posed a lot of the issues that I think were central to Jonas's thinking in that series. And he was resident here right. when he produced that with the BBC and did the book with Little Brown. And actually, I got to know all of them then because the university became involved with a course that was built around it. But it was very exciting and very energizing, although it didn't sustain after Bruno. It, I, I'm not sure they attracted enough of his ilk. Well, I think that, that, that that's one of the things Gary was getting at, is the yeah. original vision and dream of the Institute would be a place where, where a biologist and a humanist or an artist yeah. could walk together, could exchange ideas about humanity to solve the problems of humanity um, and, and to be able to talk on those levels. And as, it, as the Institute itself evolved, it became more and more a basic science institute and less had less and less of the, the humanity side to it. There are a lot of reasons for that, and, and it's an, an, an absolutely incredible institution at this point, um, and, and hopefully far into the future. Um, but it, it did evolve away from the, the original vision of the, of the humanities. How did your father feel about that? Well, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think the honest answer is he felt disappointment about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that he, he continued to try and realize even, you know, even in the last decade or two of his life would be to create something. Um, and Peter may have a few words to say about it. But typically of my father, he, didn't, he never really would say it was a disappointment. What he would say is, and, and, I, and he, he really meant this in the last years of his life, he said, it was an experiment. It was an interesting experiment. But Gary, remember the 60s. I do. And the Cold War. <laughs> I remember. No, seriously. And where was science funding? I mean, I have a lot of colleagues who were here on the faculty. 
and there was the expansion of funding for basic research and the growth of NSF and NIH, Department of Energy, DOD, that's where the research and development money was coming from. And I don't want to say the humanities were starved, but the humanities were starved. <laughs> and, and I think that it was in that context. I think Roger Revelle faced that challenge as well, because I think he shared Jonas's uh, vision uh, of a comprehensive university that was as, as great in philosophy and literature as it was in biology and chemistry. But the realities of public funding at that time made it really difficult. But he wanted to develop scientists who are also humanists, and we saw the need for it in the 1960s. They're beginning to build. We go into October of 1962, the missiles of October. We nearly uh, have nuclear conflagration with the Soviet Union when they put missiles into Cuba. So these were all things on your dad's mind. And based on what I read, he wanted to have scientists who if they didn't think in a humanist way themselves, they were at least surrounded by humanists who would speak to the consequence and the implication of the science they produced, not just at the Salk Institute, but internationally. Is that a fair reading of what happened? Yeah, I, it's an interesting thing for me. First, just physically. Right. The um, idea for the Institute was not only to have the laboratory buildings that are right. there in uh, such an extraordinary structure, but there was also a meeting center that Khan had designed, which was he put, if anything, even more love and care into. That was to be the place where people from the natural sciences, the, the humanities, the social sciences would come together to deal with, as my father put it, those problems confronting humanity that can't be solved in the laboratory. Right. So it was a huge disappointment for my father. The money never was there to build that structure. The money wasn't even there to complete the laboratory buildings. The endowment had to be invaded in order to complete the complete that structure. And as Jonathan said, even though my father viewed it as an experiment from the beginning, it was a deep disappointment for him. And even in the last years of his life, uh, he still held that dream of seeing that ultimately take place. And it's a funny thing for me because being his son, and I think it was probably the case for all three of us, his unfulfilled desires stuck with me. They, they are you know, part of my being. They're stuck there in my, in my gut. And so I've carried that vision and that dream with me ever since. And, and it's been something that I've been hoping for his sake, so to speak, would ultimately be fulfilled. But I've begun to wonder whether the powers that be at the Institute, in a sense, or, or nature in its, in its evolutionary, um, in the way it e has evolved, whether the wise thing indeed didn't take place. In other words, the Institute may be much the stronger for having gone the course that it did. It's a purely scientific research institute. It has a focus. It has a concentration, broad areas of research being covered. And I just wonder whether if there had been an attempt, if, if the early work with the Council on Biology and Human Affairs and Jacob Bernofsky or Bruno's contributions, if that had persisted and grown, whether in some way it wouldn't have weakened the fabric of the Institute as it is now. So the Institute's over, it was founded, what, 55 years ago this year. The buildings were finished 50 years ago. And I just wonder what will, Nate, what will happen in the next 50 years, the next half century, the next century beyond. There's a lot of time yet. The Institute's going through a natural process, and perhaps there will come a time when it would be a, a more natural thing for there to be this expanded interest. And well, I, you're, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I mean, I think that's wonderfully well put, Peter. And I, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I was just going to say something fairly simple, but, but hopefully meaningful. What he vis envisioned is extraordinarily difficult to do. Yes. It's extraordinarily difficult to, for, for these two areas of human thought to, and, and creativity to come together. And that's one of the reasons why it didn't happen. He was cursed a lot of times by having ideas that were ahead of his time. And I do believe that he saw something that will emerge in the future. But to, not to give credit where credit is due, but give difficulty where difficulties due, it's not an easy thing. Yeah. 
Well, he didn't get a full loaf, so to speak, but everybody sitting in this room knows he got at least a half of a loaf yeah. in the sense that he hired Louis Kahn to design this building, yeah. and everybody is widely believed that this is one of the gems of architecture in American science. Um, Robert Redford was there uh, filming. It was one of the cathedrals of um, culture. Ca cathedrals, cathedrals of culture. Right. It is an extraordinary thing. Um, how did he come to meet Louis Kahn? Um, he actually met Louis Kahn because he was looking for someone to consult with about how to choose an architect. So <laughs> Louis Kahn had built some buildings, uh, some laboratory buildings at, at, I believe, at Pennsylvania University. Right. And um, he went to visit him. They met, and it was kismet. Yeah. They were two peas in a pod, in a sense, and they both spoke on these very high levels about nature and the cosmos and the, the, the order of the universe. And they immediately began to work together. And, and as, as has been said, my dad found his architect. Louis Kahn found his favorite client. Mm. Louis Kahn loved working with my dad because he was so involved in the design process of, of the Institute. He understood the principles. He understood how meaningful and how important architecture is and how it creates an environment. And so he was very much part of that design process. And I, I will say one of the, him, his doing that is one of the most admirable things from my personal point of view that he's done. Um, the, the vaccine was unsurpassable. But for a scientist like himself to step out of that role and to step into a role that is more artistic, more creative, um, and to do it so successfully is you know, really, really an amazing thing. And just to make a community comment, mm -hmm. reflecting on the ways in which the San Diego City Council in the last few years have repudiated and embarrassed uh, a number of men and women with great vision in terms of developing our park or other parts of the city, Khan and Salk met with the whole council. Hmm. And, and Khan went with him. Really? And had a conversation about their dream and their vision. And people got excited. And, you know, they, I, I, I just think there was a, a dynamic there really that something. it would be nice to capture anew in our civic space. I want to say something, which is the experience my father had with the design of the Institute shows two different aspects of his personality. One was his absolute obsession with detail. Mm. He couldn't let something be out of place. He mm. wanted this structure to shine. Mm. And it drove a lot of people crazy because he's, he didn't want anything to move forward unless it was right. right. The other thing had to do something with the subject of, of tonight's conversation with the creative process. And I'll just tell one story which has stuck with me because I can't imagine having the courage to do what my father did. I think it was 1962. Um, the Khan and his team had done a tremendous amount of work going through one design after another, and finally had a complete design for the laboratory buildings, which were four buildings side by side, separated by two narrow courtyards. And there was a meeting with the, uh, the builders, and a contract was signed to build that structure. Mm. That evening, my father went out onto the, uh, the cliffs and looked back at the site and just knew something wasn't right. He didn't know what it was, but he couldn't sleep that night. And the next morning, he and Khan flew together on a plane to San Francisco to meet with Basil O'Connor of the National Foundation. My father said, Lou, we've got to start over. <laughs> and he took a piece of paper and he sketched out what he had in mind, which was two buildings with a single courtyard. And actually, Jonathan, I think you were present when the sort of final uh, stroke took place in, in this process. Uh, Khan, to his great credit, understood. Hmm. And he said, Jonas, you're right. We'll start over. His team, who'd been working through the night for however many months when he got back to Philadelphia, uh, weren't so enthusiastic <laughs> about that decision and put up a, a two-month battle. And uh, it I, I was away, and uh, the meeting took place with Khan and perhaps Jack McAllister and, and Jonathan as a child was, 
was present, what, what I've seen my father, what, the, what he's written about this was that he just asked one question f finally, which was, which is stronger, one courtyard or two? Mm. And that it was almost it. feels like your dad was lucky that someone didn't put him in the trunk of a car and dump him out in the desert. <laughs> there were many people who wanted to do that. But you know, Gary, Brian was mentioning the archives at right. UCSD, and I listened to a lot of the interviews when we were writing this book. And one that really stuck with me was with David Arnold, the Moon Rocks guy, uh, and Sally Ride's mentor. And he said in the interview, uh, we didn't want anybody here unless they were full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> People who got along weren't going to succeed here because we were creating something from nothing. Mm -hmm. And also the, the culture, and we talked about this, TSRI, on yeah. whose board Lynn sits, right. Salk, UCSD, all were started by people who were sort of on the outside or in conflict with establishment universities, establishment science. They wanted to create something new and different. And going back to your question about Roger, you know, how important was it that he got Salk here? Right. Really important, because you get eight or ten folks like that, a couple of whom won Nobel Prizes and one of whom discovered the polio vaccine, and suddenly you've got that leadership cadre to create what we see on the Mesa today. I wonder if this, maybe I'm overstating this, but I wonder if this goes to an aspect of Dr. Salk's character. He felt things very deeply, whether it was the arts, the humanities, the books he was working on, the science, felt it very deeply. Wrote, 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 spoke, spoke, spoke. But he had trouble expressing what was really, what was really in his heart. So it was that part of it that he would look and he would see what he wanted and it wasn't quite there, but he had trouble kind of saying, here's what I really want. Because it was part of the books. Um, and you touched on two things about him. I mean, one, it's not directly what you were asking about, but one, what he often said, and I think um, his assistants will, will recognize this. But sometimes he didn't, he would say, I don't know what I want until I see it. Right. So he couldn't always articulate in detail what he wanted. And it, he was enjoyable and difficult to work with because you, he, he would say to do something and you would do it and you'd bring it up and then it wasn't quite what he wanted until you finally got to the point where he'd go, aha, that's what I wanted. But he must have in the end got it because of a quote that I heard from you guys when I was researching the story about a year ago. Well, you told me the story at, at your home. You said your father would walk around the buildings during his daily walks and he would unconsciously run his fingers on the exterior of the building. It was an unconscious act of love for the building and what it represented. He wasn't aware of what he was doing, but he was doing it. Mm -hmm. So that must have, he must have loved what he came up with. In the end, did he fulfill his desire of building a place that would be worthy of a visit by Picasso? He did. He, he did. And, and he was proud of that, and it was a you know, tremendous success in his life. And that, I mean, that gesture, that sense of, of, of touch with the building, it was the same touch he had if he was talking with someone. He touched him on an elbow. He, he was human. He was warm. He was a physician. Um, and so that, that sense of appreciation it was imbued in the building as well. Okay. Well, the salt goes on, it gets built, it, it, it matures, it's adding more people. We go into the 1970s, we go into the 1980s. Uh, your father continues research in many areas, multiple sclerosis, cancer, AIDS. Um, but what he also did was write books on some really heavy subjects. Um, uh, world population, human values, the anatomy of reality, which was a bit hard for me to get my mind around. Now, there's some family stuff here going on that should be very interesting. He wrote all of these books, but it wasn't an easy birth with any of these books. He collaborated with the two of you. Tell me what it was like to work with your dad on these books, because he had these ideas, but putting them in the form where everybody can understand them seemed to be a difficult thing. You're on for that. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll add a little PS. Um, 
everyone who's read his writings and even listened to him, he had a very almost Byzantine way of expressing himself. And it was partly because his mind was so active that he would want so many ideas to be contained in one small sentence or in one small paragraph that would get incredibly dense. So, um, so it, working with him on these things was difficult in that respect. Um, I worked with him on, on a book called War, Population, and Human Values, which fortunately had a lot of graphs and little text. But I remember so well spending hours with him um, going over something, looking at some detail, moving something from one place to another. Um, and there was just this amazing editorial process where if I didn't stop him or if I didn't stop the process, we would end up with something that was relatively incomprehensible. <laughs> Actually, going back and looking at his writings now, I realize if I can sit with them and parse them out, there's a lot of wisdom, there's a lot of sense in there, but it's, it's very difficult to, to kind of wade your way through it. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something about his early, the earlier part of his career um, when we still lived in Pittsburgh and he was working on the polio vaccine and writing scientific papers. My mother, a very verbal, intelligent woman, um, helped him with writing his papers because as she put it, he, he, his, his writing in English was like German. He could, have the, he could have the verb at the end of the sentence. So. But didn't your mother barely speak English? You're talking about your mom? No, our there's, mom. There's our, our birth mother, oh, Donna, um, right. and then of course um, my father's second wife, Francoise Gillot, who speaks English very well, okay. and whose daughter um, is in the audience along with her husband. Well, let's go back a little bit before all of this. Um, I asked you this question uh, when we were at your house like about a year ago, and you gave me a very good, clear, honest answer. Um, I asked, I said, Peter, where did this all come from? This, uh, your, your father was a son of immigrants. Uh, your mom barely spoke English. These aren't people that had a lot of money. My grandmother, but go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. But from very early on, he didn't come from a place of culture. It wasn't a family that had a lot of money that went to the theater all the time, um, although he went on quickly and established himself in education. Um, but where did that come from? I, this was something that was just plain peculiar to my father. Actually, there are several, a number of factors. Jonathan, who's a psychiatrist, can probably delve into them a little bit more, <laughs> uh, a little bit more professionally. On the one hand, there was his mother, who was a very domineering woman. Mm -hmm. She had three sons, and she wanted them to be proficient and effective and successful in life. Her main focus was, in a sense, on my father as the oldest, and she put a lot of attention into cultivating him. He learned a lot from that relationship because he had to figure out how to survive in the face of this domineering right. personality. But the other aspect of it was just what was peculiar to him. He, from the beginning, was a very inward, insightful, thoughtful person. He metabolized everything that he saw when it came to the polio vaccine work. He wasn't only dealing with the questions of the virus and the test tubes and so on. He was dealing with the human interaction. So from the beginning, he was always thinking and metabolizing very deeply what was going on around him. Then there was a kind of, quirk is the wrong word, but there, were, there was something unusual that followed. Your dad was relentless in his pursuit of the vaccine. There were competing ideas for the vaccine. Um, your father was criticized by a lot of people, particularly Albert Sabin, about his approach. Some of it became personal, and it would become personal for the rest of their lives. Um, really bad, ugly things that were said in public. And yet, your father never publicly fought back, and he was the one that was right. I still don't understand that. He didn't defend himself then, and really later in life when other issues came up. So he had an idea, he got behind it, he believed it, he spoke about it. But if people came back at him, he just let them speak. And it wasn't like, you're wrong, I disagree. No, it what, was, it what was, was going on, what was going on there? Yeah, it was not his nature to engage directly in confrontation to the extent that he could avoid that. But he would persist, persist, persist to talk about the world the way he saw it. Let's talk about the evolution of your father's um, personality. One of the things I've read is that there was quite a change in his personality when he married Francois Gillot. Tell me about that. 
Jonathan or his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, Her daughter. <laughs> it, it, it came, it, he, there, they came at a, a phase in his life where there was a great deal of change. He had um, evolved into a, a new position with the Institute, was mainly founding director, um, was active in his lab, but um, he had gotten through the divorce with my mom. Mm -hmm. And um, meeting Francois was, was a, just a, a remarkable thing in his life. Perhaps you should tell the audience who she was for those who don't know. Oh, Francois Gillot, who was my father's um, wife, had been the mistress of Picasso and, and had two children. She'd been his partner for 10 years. That's really something to have on a resume, the mistress of Picasso. Well, she also was the author of a best-selling right. book. She was a very accomplished mm -hmm. painter and artist and she st she intellectual. Still, she is, still is. And still is. And so in, in one sense, I can't resist, Gary, I am a woman, she was his peer. And the two of them as a couple in this town, which was basically a military town, right. uh, helped kind of redefine the whole character of the social world here. I shared with my colleagues that in the old days, you couldn't get anybody to come to a party unless you had an admiral there, right? <laughs> And uh, because of the Rebels and Jonas and Francoise, suddenly that's who you wanted to go to parties with. And I'm a sociologist, so we do this pop kind of stuff. But it's, it, these are not unimportant indicators. And we call this session creativity, which we've been talking about a lot, but also culture. And the presence of these uh, uh, wonderful scientists, but also many of them who were citizen scientists, mm. who were very socially engaged because of their own energy or because of spouses and other things, really did kind of change the culture of San Diego uh, in a very profound way. Did it open your father's personality up more? Was he a different person? I think uh, he began to blossom in a different way in that relationship. Uh, his, he began to dress in differently. Um, he very much enjoyed all of the social avenues that were opened up to him through that relationship. Um, it, it made a huge difference in his life. Did you see the, th uh, the same thing? Yes, absolutely. I mean, in part, she opened up a gave him access to a world of philosophers, of thinkers, of poets, of painters. Um, and it was very much a part of his life that, that he had wanted to be exposed to and, and, and he wanted to be part of. Um, so it, the, his life blossomed in, in a number of ways at, at that point. Became I, colorful. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, and one of the ways in which they were a wonderful couple was that they both had that kind of expansiveness. Um, with, it's, it's a little personal, but with my mom, she liked an orderly household and she didn't like unexpected guests for dinner. And mm -hmm. she, she, her idea of a good evening was to get in bed and read a, read a, book, read a good book. Right. Um, this was not my father. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he wanted very much to have a home and a, and a life that would welcome people in, that would expand and do that. And Francoise was a perfect mate for them. Did she change as a result? What did, she, what did he bring to her life? Well, we didn't know her beforehand, so I would have to speculate. Um, but I think he brought, um, certainly initially in their relationship, some warmth, some, some stability, um, an exposure to the scientific world, which I think she had not been part of, and I think that had influence on her work. Um, but Francoise is, is a very successful, a very intelligent, a very creative, a very accomplished woman in her own right, right. Um, and re regardless of with whom she had been. Um, and that her development as a painter, her development as a thinker continued and I think was nurtured in the relationship. They, they were matched in one way. I won't get this quote quite right. Uh, yeah, for, forgive him for that. But I think that Francoise has said that my father was an artistic scientist right. and she was and is a scientific artist. But what was the uh, bombshell in the Salk household when you guys learned he's going to marry uh, Picasso's lover, ex-lover? 
That must have been something. Seems like something to me. <laughs> so Gary, I mean. I'm sorry I, to keep reminding this. Gary, but <laughs> I mean, I was a young woman and I remember thinking, Jonas Salk has married the author of one of the best-selling books in America. And the notion that she was, def I mean, she did write the book about that relationship. Right, sure. But, but, but she was a person in her own right. No, no, she was not just and a person. <laughs> keep, keep going. But <laughs> I, and so that's what I think was so important about them. And we have a lot of stories about UCSD about Helen Meyer, you know, the housewife who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, that's what the newspaper reported. And she came here for the first time in her life as a, full, as a professor. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot about this place on the Mesa that honored excellence. And uh, I saw them as part of that sort of exceptionality of people who were building this community in a new way. This is an unbelievably strong woman. This is, Francoise is just an, ex, an extraordinary human being. And frankly, having, from the moment of having met her, it was her personality that dominated. Picasso just didn't, at least for me, didn't come into my mind. She was, she was uh, fully sufficient in and of herself. Hmm. Wonderful. Let's talk um, in this last part about the last 10 years of your dad's life. Uh, if, could you give us a sense for what that was like, what he was involved in, what he may have accomplished, and how that lifted all the things we're talking about, creativity, culture, the sense of community here in Southern California and in La Jolla. Were there particular things? Want to try? Um, I'll try. <laughs> um, the last 10 years of his life were incredibly active and rich for a man who was between the ages of 70 and 80. It was, he was active all the time. He was traveling. He was involved in different organizations. He was consulting. Um, and he had, but he continued to have two passions. One was his involvement, which we won't talk about much, but it, with, with an AIDS vaccine, which was very prominent and right. very much part of his, of his activity in the, in the last part of his life. Um, and he continued, um, but he continued writing. He continued thinking. He continued to find ways to apply those basic laws of nature as he saw them to, to the human condition, through writing, through talking, through lecturing, um, and through organizing people to some, to some extent. I, I think what was continued in that phase in his life, but, but I think was part of what Mary has, has touched on in terms of the development of the community here in San Diego was it, he was also about community. He was also about how do people relate to each other? How do ideas happen? How can we get groups of people together to do things to change the world? So there, there, was, it, there was culture and there was community and, and this continued to be part of his life. Okay. There's one last thing. We're gonna to go to uh, ask questions of the public here after this next question. I'm trying to give people, younger people, a sense of a modern parallel. Are there scientists, humanists today who remind you of Jonas Salk? Who do we see in today's society that might be like him? In society or here in San Diego? Because I think there's some here. Well, tell me. Um, uh, I don't think they're identical to what Jonas wanted to accomplish, but this notion of caring about the role of science in society mm -hmm and being able to connect with people at multiple levels and, and uh, around multiple issues. Uh, I mean, Eric Topol is doing an enormous amount to get people excited about medicine and its promise. Uh, I'm a great admirer of Walter Monk, and he was here when Jonas came, but Walter still plays this public role, engaging a larger community whether it's the Office of Naval Research or AAAS or the Downtown Rotary, he's there and he charms and people like him. And if that's what a scientist is like, that's pretty cool. And uh, Craig Venter has some of those qualities. And uh, so I think we need more scientists like that who can engage at some level with a larger society but we're not yet starved for them. Mm -hmm. We have some good ones here. 
Can you think of um, people? You know, it's sort of funny, but um, just having grown up with my father, he sort of has filled my horizon. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to answer your question in a slightly different way, okay. which is I, 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 partly I can't, I can't really think of anything. I mean, he was really one of a kind, and, and how his life evolved and what happened was, was really very different from anyone that I can think of. But there are people that I think of who are carrying out the kinds of things that he would like to see carried out at this point. Um, and there probably are many more than I can think of. Um, and, but the, the, the two people that I think of that are engaged in the kind of activity that he thought would be important is one whose name I've forgotten is, is the end of poverty. Is this Jeffrey Sachs? Jeffrey Sachs. Sachs, yeah. right. Um, who is engaged in really trying to change the world, of really looking at the world at the level of population, at the level of distribution of wealth, economic development in, in underdeveloped countries, and health. Uh, and it crosses a broad spectrum of things. This is the kind of thinking my father done, did, and it's the kind of thing that he's actually doing in, in the real world. And I think that would move him greatly. I think some of the things that Bill Gates is saying these days and talking about um, are, are about global health, are about what are the positive things that are happening in terms of the changes that are going on, and what can we do at what levels. Those people, when they do things like that, they remind me of my dad. Excellent. I want to thank you. I didn't have the good fortune to meet your dad. I wish I had. But in talking to you and getting to know you, I, I feel like I've come away with something and you, Mary. So thank you so much. And thank you for coming out this evening. <laughs>